Thank you, Tiffany, and Roundtable Global for providing this platform for all of us to gather with this shared vision. As uh, Tiffany mentioned, um, I'm an interdisciplinary artist, and the project I'm most passionate about, my recent one, um, it's been about 18 months working on this, Intercultural, which is a collection of contemporary fine art photography and the sound art collaboration, as she mentioned, with Nelly Furtado. Um, the inspiration behind Intercultural is reflective of my own experiences in the world as well as a reference to my ancestral roots. Um, that I often refer back to the British Raj era. Um, in 1891, uh, my great-great-grandmother played on a beach in Goa, India and had a British soldier approach her and offer her candy. She had accepted this as a kind gesture. He then <coughs> offered her more, although um, suggested she follow him. There was this stash of candy to be had on his ship. Once on board, he led her to a shipping crate where he sealed the entrance and trapped her. She lived in this crate for a month as she sailed along the oceanic route from the west coast of India to the South Pacific island of Fiji. Anchored in the port of Latoka, she was then taken to a sugarcane plantation where she continued life as a slave. And it was there she met my great-great-grandfather, also a child who had been kidnapped from India and enslaved in Fiji. Um, while generations passed on this colonized island, um, it was in 1963 when my father and grandmother were officially recognized as British subjects and boarded the Southern Cross bound for Great Britain. Um, you know, racism was quite prevalent during this time in London when they landed at the infamous London docks. And, you know, my father was unfortunately beaten often by skinheads who disapproved of his settlement. Um, you know, despite this deplorable relation, my father did, in fact, marry an English woman. And, you know, therein lies my genes um, in the country we like to refer to as the United Kingdom. Although you know, my father's biggest concern was uh, due to his experiences that I um, had no hope in London that I you know, would succumb to this racial behavior and tension and um, he didn't want me to follow in his footsteps and hence we immigrated to Vancouver, Canada. Um, although, you know, the truth is you cannot run from racism. Um, you know, while I'm half Indian and half English, I do consider myself North American and in this world, I've come to realize that you know, mankind visually interprets their environment as a survival instinct, and individuals are categorized. And I do find that um, due to my skin tone, um, inevitably this barrier of discriminative notions are formed. Um, <clears throat> I created intercultural as a way to reflect how different yet similar we are. Um, as also, the intention is really to enlighten ideologies initiate uh, common respect for each other and ultimately lead to a peaceful coexistence. Um, I believe that our disassociation from each other is really due to our lack of knowledge and understanding of each other's attachment to cultural identity. And um, I, this may be a good time to <laughs> show you some of the work. Um, as you can see, a lot of the portraits, um, there's 20 pieces uh, in the collection so far. It's a touring exhibition, so it was showed in Toronto and recently in Miami Art Basel, and we'll have a local show uh, in Santa Monica in the summer. Um, so the, the first culture I guess I'll reference is Indian women. Um, th there isn't a lot of time to talk about each culture. I've cherry-picked a few. Um, Indian women's wearing a red sari, for example, and red in the Hindu culture or Indian culture is uh, you know, a celebration color. And uh, this would be traditionally a color worn on a woman's wedding day. Um, also, you know, she's wearing the bindi, which is uh, your point of enlightenment, transcendence. Um, although if you see a woman with a simple black dot, that is a statement that she's available for marriage. Um, red simply means that she is already married. Um, there's they like to make sure that's clear. <laughs> no confusion. Um, and, as, and then um, for Pakistani women, um, I, I kind of like to have these together in the sense I, you know, these are people that came from the same land um, due to their philosophical practices of faith, whether it was Hinduism or Muslim, 
Um, this is unfortunately led to one of the world's uh, greatest like mass migrations and unfortunately somewhere around two million lives lost. It was Gandhi who you know was setting forth India's independence and advocated uh, for religious pluralism and the partition of India, which then formed Pakistan. So while it's, um, and I w myself was even raised, well, we just don't get along with those people. Um, and, <laughs> you know, without even um, understanding why uh, this is, so I do, do not carry this burden of um, animosity that has unfortunately uh, been put forth from ancestral roots. Um, next. Moroccan woman, I love this portrait because I feel like she's like this desert princess that is um, has a, a, a walking story. Uh, she um, actually is from an area that we would know as the Bourbon uh, culture, but actually uh, her tribe is Amazigh, and Bourbon is actually a Spanish word that means barbarian, so <laughs> it's actually very offensive to say that, but we just kind of know them as that. Um, and, you know, in the time when, during the Pan-Arab expansion, they were conquered, they were tribe conquered, um, you know, Muslim faith practices were, for them, imposed, and uh, this, you know, meant things like their tattooing of their face that they would have normally done, they were no longer legally allowed to do, so went to um, embroidery on their clothes, which is, that pattern actually wards off evil spirits. Um, notably in this portrait for me is the Hand of Fatima. The Hand of Fatima has two thumbs and is actually um, openly a peace symbol worn uh, for women who, again, do not carry this burden of animosity um, and disassociation. They, it's a sign that they are at peace. They're at peace with the people around them, notably, you know, Muslim and Jewish. Um, next, Japanese. Japanese women. Um, Japan translates that uh, to the sun, and kimono, which she is wearing, actually um, simply means thing to wear. Um, it became quite popular. Um, the kimonos themselves used to be two-piece outfits, and then eventually became a one-piece that um, was really popularized um, by samurais, believe it or not, <laughs> because of their warlords and landlords that were fighting and battling each other as they were trying to expand. Everyone could know which samurai belonged to who, sort of thing. Um, while it is embraced as a cultural distinct identity in what they're wearing, um, th there is inherent influences in the kimonos uh, from the Western culture. You'll see in like Art Nouveau designs or Art Deco patterns kind of stitched in. Um, to the kimonos, and uh, it was just became a convenient, the one piece that they could just tie it, so they didn't have to worry about who was what size, you know, it was somewhat, and now it's traditional, while it's distinctual, it's more something they'll wear during like a tea ceremony or a wedding or, you know, any sort of significant event where they would like to share that they are of Japanese descent. Next we have Saudi Arabian woman. Um, she's wearing hijab, which um, is, means to veil, and uh, the niqab over the face obviously um, covers her entirely, leaving her only her eyes exposed. Um, while this is a significant uh, means to respect her faith practice of the Muslim faith, um, this was something that was actually introduced to Saudi Arabia in 1932. Um, prior to that, there was uh, a 30-year conflict um, prior to al Saud uh, crowning himself king after conquering all the tribes along the Persian Gulf, um, he met with clerics and they wanted to figure out how they can have this law and order and um, that's where they had come to the decision in 1932 that um, it would be enforceable what a woman wears. And uh, hence, generations later, women are still wearing these. Um, well, you know, she's taught that this is um, a way to recognize her faith practice and honor it. It's also her sign of modesty, and also she is taught that this is her way of protecting herself from an assault that otherwise may happen if she was exposed in any way. Um, and it is law, and she can be punished from public lashings to uh, imprisonment for not wearing it. North American women kind of brings to us to the forefront of our modern times and um, North American woman to me is ambiguous. She could be from anywhere in the world. So it certainly brings to the forefront um, our ideas of racial profiling. Um, and 
considering I'm allowed to dress how I please, I simply chose something I felt was kind of reflective of me as an artist with the patterns and uh, the sharp lines to me as, you know, urban qualities. And I feel like this portrait really represents where we are come together and we are one as the human race. This brings me to, you know, the relevance of art and the responsibility of an artist. Historically, artists served as a vision for ideals, cultural identity, um, as well as artists have been re revered for their integral voice and perception found in a master discipline that engages communities in a language that is universally understood. And that is my full intention with Intercultural is to help provide a, a universal language where we can understand each other and appreciate our differences, learn from each other, and understand that we are one as the human race. Thank you.